that uh, being said, I'd like to tell you about Dr. Ed Huckabee, as you see here. He is our clinician today. He's also known as a composer of band music. He is a conductor and clinician, well, uh, very well known. He has published over 200 works, and he's also been working for over 46 years in music education and higher up, and just told me a little bit ago that he is currently retired from being retired, so he's uh, in his second day. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Ed Huckleby. Thank you, and thanks for being among the, the dedicated that get up on Saturday morning to be at an 8 o'clock uh, session. Uh, we appreciate that very much, and I will to try to help save my band director voice and teacher voice, I'll, I'll use a little bit of the microphone today. I do want to begin by acknowledging um, Stan uh, Music for helping sponsor this project, as well as my publisher, C.L. Warren House Company. So I don't forget to do that today, and I'm going to do that up front. Um, when we communicate something, we often communicate with the idea that everybody understands what we're saying. Not always the case. Um, so if I say something, and if I get it, we're going to do this pretty quickly, actually. And so we get through it, and, and you have some time for question and answer about what to, the program's about. But if I uh, communicate something that just isn't quite clear to you, you be sure to jump in there. This, I want this to be as interactive as it needs to be. Uh, not like little Johnny, who at the end of, uh, uh, end of uh, church on Sunday morning came up to the preacher and said, uh, Preacher, I'm going to give you, when I grow up, I'm going to uh, get a good job and I'm going to give you half of what I earn. And the preacher who had just preached on tithing uh, stuck his chest out and said, well, Johnny, what was it that I said that uh, it impressed you so? And little Johnny says, oh, no, it wasn't what you said. It was what my daddy said. He said, you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. Well, what, uh, what his dad said and what Johnny heard were two different things. Uh, he he took, interpreted poor much differently than his dad intended. So if, I, if I'm communicating and you need clarification, jump right in. Don't feel uh, reluctant to jump right in. Let me give you just a little bit of um, background here, an overview on what we're going to cover. First, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the methodology for teaching preparatory skills for sight reading. Uh, how do, what do we do to help students learn to sight read? We're going to talk a bit about uh, the scope and sequence of the, of the product that you have in your hand there, which is brand new. We just rolled this out uh, last month at the Midwest Conference in Chicago. So uh, this is, uh, some of you may have received flyers in the mail from Barn House. Uh, you may have picked up a flyer yesterday uh, at the stamp booth, and obviously you've got a flyer here today. But it's a brand new product. So we're excited about that. We're going to talk about the divine learning outcomes that are a part of this uh, process, and part of the procedure, and part of the product. And then we're going to also talk about the assessment tools uh, which will help you to meet local, state, and national standards. Now, the, uh, uh, you got a little bit of an introduction of, of uh, my background, but let me just give you a, a little more information. I spent eight years as an elementary, junior high, and high school band director. I spent uh, 13 years as a college university band director. I spent uh, 20 years as a music department chair I uh, was a higher ed center director for two years. I was a graduate dean for seven years. I was an arts administrator with a ballet company for a year. I was a university vice president for 10 years. And the last uh, five years of my career, I spent as a university president. And among all that, uh, uh, I've been a composer of band music for 30 years, which means I have 96 <coughs> years of experience. So. Uh, so fortunately, some of those uh, sentences were ran concurrently, so uh, I hope that uh, what you're seeing in the product before you is that uh, there's a lot of experience that has gone into putting this together. I was just sharing earlier that uh, we've talked about this particular uh, concept for about five years with the publishing company. And uh, they invited me to take on this project and Basically, what I uh, 
what I said was when I retire and I have time to do this, we're going to do it. So the last 18 months of my life in semi-retirement has been focused on this project. And we just uh, we just wrapped it up, and the final product uh, went to print a week before Midwest. So it's uh, literally hot off the press. Go test your awareness of uh, uh, current events. Somebody tell me what that logo. Who does that represent? Anybody? Any guesses? Wait, watch. Jump in. You guys are way too healthy. <laughs> this is Weight Watchers. This is the, the new Weight Watchers logo. Anybody have any idea what the new Weight Watchers slogan is? Success starts here. And I'm hoping that uh, at the end of this clinic and down, uh, down the road, you're going to say, January 30th, 2016, that's where the future success of my band program started with this uh, new program that is going to help you make your musicians, your young students, uh, uh, your young musicians more proficient. This is a concept that I'm going to convey to you, and I want to see if you agree. The ability to read music aside is one of the most important assets a successful music can possess. Anybody, uh, anybody? Want to take that to task? I think we all can agree that sight reading, being able to read music aside, is a really, really important part of uh, being a successful musician. The fundamental premise in the book and the book series that uh, we have uh, uh, put together here, that you have the first book of in your hand, is that sight reading skills are built upon music literacy foundations, which can be measurably Assessed. Now, how many of you have heard any discussions about assessment before? I'm going to say everybody in the room <coughs> is pretty hard with the term assessment. I know that in Ohio it's it's a hot topic. Across the country it's a hot topic, and uh, we've been doing some form of assessment for years and years and years. In music, we've always done assessment. We just haven't always done it in the form that the administrators understand or can appreciate. Uh, I know back in my early days in junior high, high school, elementary teaching, uh, the buzzword was accountability. And we, we uh, had to, to address the issue of accountability. And now we're talking about uh, the assessment components. And if the ability to read music inside is one of the most important assets to a musician, we have to ask ourselves, how do we teach sight reading skills? What elements of music literacy are involved in reading music at sight? And what tools are available to assist learners in developing outstanding sight reading skills? Um, let me say again, and for those coming in, I really appreciate your spending your morning with me here and and I've always found that uh, to get teachers out, you either have to have food or door prizes. So I don't have any food this morning. We do have some door prizes at the end of the, the, the session here. So, uh, so stay with me through, through this session. Um, the premise I'm going to present to you is that following a predetermined sight reading, we're going to address the first question. Following a predetermined sight reading process or procedure will improve the sight reading skills and provide long-term benefits to both the ensemble, your, your band, uh, and to the individual musicians. Now, how do we go about teaching some of these concepts? Uh, you've probably heard the term uh, mnemonics before. These are devices that are used to aid memory. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say to you that every time you see the Weight Watcher logo now, every time you see a Weight Watcher uh, commercial on TV because of the, one of these, uh, these devices, which in this case, uh, these are some of the devices, association, you're going to associate Weight Watchers with sight reading. Now, mark, mark my word, next time you see a Weight Watchers commercial, you're going to think about sight reading because that's one, of, that's one of the concepts. And you're going to think, my goodness, I haven't bought that book yet. i got to go buy that book, but uh, those book series. 
But so that's one of the methods, one, is association with all of these imagery, storytelling, visualization. What we use in this particular process that we're defining as a sight reading technique is called an acronym. We're all familiar with acronyms. And the acronym that we've uh, devised, if you will, is what we refer to as market radar. Now you have a handout uh, in your a little packet there. And also, uh, in the book, inside the, the book on the, I believe it's the second page, you have an almost identical. Every student book has this uh, sight reading process defined, the market radar process. And so uh, uh, our graphics department came up with a wonderful logo here for market radar. And the terms are very simple. They're all music literacy terms. Meter, key, tempo, rhythm, accidentals, dynamics, articulation, and roadmap. Those are the elements of music, of music literacy, that we're going to be uh, looking for as we go through the sight reading process with our students. And by learning this process, the students are all on the same page with the director. The director has a roadmap, if you will, that uh, he or she can use to help the students sight read. And we're going to go through an actual process here of how you would take your students through this sight reading uh, exercise. And anytime you're sight reading, uh, anything you put in front of your group, this is the process you follow. First, you approach the meter, checking the beginning of the meter, the signature, the time signature, scan from top left to bottom right, locate and identify any changes in meter. Uh, if possible, circle the meter size. I, I encourage uh, students to use pencils now. In a competitive sight reading situation, at, at a contest, you can't do that, obviously. But in, in sight reading, in your rehearsals and, and doing normal sight reading, I encourage students to use the pencil. Uh, and remember, unless indicated otherwise, the eighth note remains constant. Now that's a key element in this entire series, is the concept of the eighth note, of what I call the, the constant eight. And so you'll see in these exercises in the book, that, uh, that on the first page, the visual, it's a visual aid that we use in, uh, in, in conveying the concept of rhythm. So, here's an example that we're gonna take to look at the meter signature. This happens to be a piece that uh, actually is in, in the proof stage right now, will be out this coming fall, called In Ages Past. This is in the manuscript form itself. And so, if we look at the meter, here the, the, the introduction is in 4-4, and then we have quite a bit of changing meter in this piece. Now, those are meters that uh, your kids are probably going to be familiar with if, they're, if they've are if they had a, a couple of years instruction, probably. But, let's look. Are there any, are there any things, is there anything there that you need to point out to a student that you would need to bring to their attention? Anybody? How about the 3-8? I think you'll be pretty, pretty comfortable with that. Maybe, maybe not. But if they've been through this series, they will, uh, because of the constant eight, eight concept. But it might be something you'd want to point out. So if you're looking at the meter, you're going to point out the meter at the beginning, and the changing meter, and especially looking at the 3-8, and, and uh, bringing that to their attention. OK, the next concept is key. We check the key signature, try to determine if the selection is major, minor, or modal. Uh, identify any key changes, scanning from top left to bottom right, uh, circle those if possible. Now, same piece, here's the key. And this is the process you're going to take your students through. Okay, we did meter, now we're doing key in this order. The keys. Okay, I, I'm looking at a trumpet part. This looks like it's in the key of G, then changes to the key of C. Well, is that right? Let's look at some of the elements to see. Okay. What are the notes? B, E, G. Well, is that, a, is that imply C to you, uh, uh, G to you? Probably not. It implies an E minor chord, does it not? E, G, B. Uh, after the key change, whoops, let's take that back just a minute. After the key change, uh, does that look like C major? Probably not, because uh, you're outlining an A minor chord. Now, your students may not be able to, to to the point of being able to say, okay, that's an A minor chord, or that's, a, that's a, a, an E minor chord. But you are going to help them understand. 
this is not, this is not sound like a major, it's not going to be a major. Uh, this is going to sound much different. In fact, uh, uh, actually, it's global. But uh, those are the things that you're going to point out to them as we look at keys. Okay, the next is tempo. So we, the, the concept is that you isolate each of these elements. We're not going to look at the piece from beginning to end and try to figure out what's there. We're going to look at each of the elements individually. So in the same piece, uh, what's the tempo marking? Maestro, so there's, a, there's the tempo marking. Uh, what, are, what do we look for next? What next affects the tempo here? Somebody jump in. What would next affect tempo? The retard. The retard, absolutely. And the fermata, right? Mm -hmm. The retard and the fermata. So we want to put the, point those out. That's part of the process where we would define the students. Here's what you're looking for. What would it, uh, impact the tempo? And here's the next tempo marking. So those are the things that affect tempo. The next in our series is rhythm. Scan the selection for unusual or tricky rhythms and syncopations. Uh, isolate and and verbalize or sing or clap whatever method you use. Mark it with a pencil. It comes back to that market radar. Uh, so here's the same piece. So what are the rhythms? What what would, do we point out there? We point out the syncopation to begin with. One and two and and uh, that up on three there. Uh, one and two and and. And that's what we're, those are the tricky spots there. That's what we'd be looking for. What else in the, in the introduction would we want to point out? Rests. Rests are, for kids, much harder to read the notes. Uh, I'm sure you've experienced that. Rests sometimes are the most difficult things for kids to read, having patience through the rest. So we're going to point out, okay, here are rest. First one's up, and, and the second one's on be four. The third one is actually indicates the release of the of the uh, half note tied at the eighth. So we're going to have a space there between that and B4. All right. In the fast section, the spiritoso, we're going to uh, point out the syncopations again. One and two and and one and two and and four. Those are the things we're going to look for. The syncopation in the three four. One and one and whatever method you use. That's what you're going to put out. You're probably also going to want to, going to take a look at the three eight measure. <coughs> so we're looking at the the syncopation <coughs> and the rhythms. So that con next concept is the uh, looking for accidentals. Now I went to a different piece. This is a little piece that uh, came out about four years ago, I think it was, and has a, a lot of unique accidentals in it. Half steps there, you can see half step going up, half step coming down. So how do those accidentals impact that piece? And uh, down toward the bottom there, you've got uh, the interval of a, what's the interval? It's not going to be fourth, isn't it? And so you have to, because that's going to be a, a very difficult interval for that uh, trumpet player to play, that augmented fourth. So you point that out. You also point out what? The accidental that carries through the measure. Sometimes they forget that. Sometimes we forget that. But uh, the A flats, for example, in the third measure down here, next to the last slide. Those F lines that carry through the measure on the third and fourth measure. And then the last line down there, my goodness, uh, you just kind of draw their attention to that, that you've got a lot of accidental that you're going to have to deal with. There are some very awkward intervals uh, to deal with. Uh, at some point in time, if you're working with this piece, you'll point out that that's a 12-tone that's a row. But uh, probably not in sight reading. You're not going to do that. So looking for accidentals. Now, this happens to be a piece that just came out this fall, and um, looks like it's in the key of F, sounds like it's in the key of F, except here's the horn part, and you've got a nice melodic line, it has a consistent E flat, <coughs> uh, a consistent accidental of an E flat. Well, the sound is going to be different than major, obviously. Um, a little test of your music theory, sounds like major with a lord seventh. Pixelidian. It's in a modal scale. It's in a modal, it has a modal melodic sound. So we want to point out, this is not a sound like major to you because, because of that E flat. So those are the things that you look for. And uh, boy, you have the, the accidentals. The next term is dynamics. We're going to look for the dynamic markings at the beginning, throughout the selection, top left to bottom right, making a mental note of any dramatic dynamic changes, subito, crescendo, decrescendo, et cetera. 
mark it with a pencil. And that's another unique thing about this market radar. There's a double entendre there. Uh, mark it with a pencil if possible. So we have, uh, back to NH's past, we have the dynamic markings of Forte, uh, the crescendo markings, changes in dynamics. What do we point, what do we point out if we're sight reading this piece with a young, a young group or with a, a senior high group? Probably the Sforzanos. Uh, those would be the most likely things to be overlooked. And then the, cha the dramatic change from Forte at 14 to Mezzo Forte uh, in the next uh, series there, and then crescendo back to Forte. So you're looking for things that they might not automatically be drawn to. That so, uh, and we're isolating all these things. It's not we're not going to go from the beginning and try to have them comprehend all of these elements at the same time. We're isolating them. The next element is articulation. You're looking for unique and, or unusual articulation markings. We're going to mark with a pencil, if possible. Prepare for sequences of uh, slurs or series of staccatos or accented notes, and identify any special markings. Now, I'm going to give you a little bonus here. Uh, I, this is the method I use to, to verbalize articulations. Uh, it's not in your handout, so if you're interested in, in uh, doing anything with this, uh, I use da for anything that's not articulated, that doesn't have an articulation mark. I use ta for accent, dot for staccato, tot for marcato, do for uh, tenuto, and ah uh for a slur or tot. Now, how do you use that in, a, in looking at articulations? You'd have ta, ah, uh, ta, tot, ta. So those are all verbalized. They can be all verbalized um, in the introduction and in the, uh, so you have a Ta uh, dot ta at uh, at the fourteen there. So it's a good way to help students understand that every note's not played the same. The young kids have a tough time understanding articulations. So if they can verbalize those, that really helps them to comprehend. Okay, uh, the marcato is different from the staccato. Uh, staccato. It's different from the regular accent. Uh, it's different from the tenuto. Uh, these are all verbalizations that can be used. Uh, Johnny says, okay, how do I articulate measure 24? What's your response? Come on. I know you're not too awake, but what do you do with that? You say, Johnny, either the composer or the publisher made a mistake, because that's not a, an articulatable uh, uh, marking. I put that in for a reason to to actually show you that you're going to need to look for you're going to need to look for errors in the new pieces you buy in the old pieces you have because publishers and composers and arrangers aren't perfect and there's a lot of dots and there's a lot of slurs and a lot of markings so that's that would probably not be intentional in all likelihood. Yeah. You, I mean, I might interpret that as an error accent. It, I mean, theoretically, but in most cases, you're not going to see that in a published piece of music. Uh, and that would be a very rare situation. So it's probably going to be a misprint. I, and I just threw that in there just to make a point that you have to be aware and on top of things. Uh, I mean, there's some really great pieces out there that have a lot of mistakes in them, to be honest. And you've probably encountered some of them. Uh, Roadmap, the last item there is checking for repeat signs, first and second endings, DCs, DSs, etc. Identify verbally and mentally uh, the locations and mark it with a pencil if possible. I always add the impossible because of the com competitive situation of sorry. So uh, this happens to be in your book there. This is the manuscript of uh, the common C set number 10. Just pointing out the repeat signs, uh, where they go, the first and second endings, you always want to make sure that they understand where that repeat takes them back. So you, you, you verbally and visually want to point out those issues of, of the roadmap. Now, this system, uh, and it's, it's not, there are other systems out there that use acronyms, obviously. This system, we think, covers a lot of detail that if, you, if your kids learn that process, and you go through that process when you put a new piece of music out, uh, I've, I've got, so we've got this uh, being field tested and, and it's been field tested for 
for a number of months. And I've got a, uh, a junior high band director in Illinois that called me last week and he said, you know what, my kids are able to read 6-8 for the first time. They could not comprehend, these are junior high kids, 7th graders, 8th graders, they could not comprehend 6-8 until we learned this method and until we got through this, this series of the CASA 8. They understand 6-8 now. And he's just so enthusiastic about it. He's applying, and a little quick story, he's applying to do a demonstration clinic at Midwest and at the, uh, at the Illinois uh, Music Educators next year. And he said, my dad's a band director. He thinks I'm crazy. I'm gonna take a junior high band to, to Midwest, or apply to, to Midwest and sock read for that audience. He said, he says, I'm crazy. But he said, I'm so convinced that, that uh, these kids are doing so well with this that I want everybody to see what it does for my kids. So, uh, I, I hope that's the type of thing that you will find uh, in, the, you know, in using this process. The market radio system is an excellent tool for sight reading preparation, which enables the students to sight read useful selections at their appropriate skill level with confidence. And that's the key, with confidence that they're not guessing. Uh, kids, unfortunately, there's so many kids out there that guess when they're sight reading, or they guess at rhythms. And so they're learning a concept that they don't have to guess. It assists the ensemble members in learning to follow the director's instructions. Wouldn't that be good? And uh, and the gestures during the reading process. Now, here's my disclaimer. Directors, you have to incorporate some of these ele other elements as we go through this process of what the system does for you. You have to incorporate other elements like intonation. That's not something that, that you can, uh, we can convey necessarily on a printed page. Uh, breath support. Uh, all of those things that go into a musical performance that can't necessarily be conveyed on a printed page. So this is not like some automated method that's going to replace a band director. Uh, your job is to, to teach them to be musicians. These are some of the mechanics involved. Now, I want you to, to pull up the book that you have, this uh, Sock Reading 101 book. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the concepts that are in here. The title of the book, even though you see Sight Reading 101, 201, and 301, if you look at the book, the, the actual title is Core Competencies, The Successful Development of Sight Reading Skills. Now, that's kind of a little verbiage, but it, it addresses the issue. These are the core, core competencies that are needed for a kid to be able to sight read. And, and when we talk about sight reading, we're talking about nothing more than music literacy. We're talking about making students musically literate. Uh, each book contains a series of sequential and progressive competency sets with identified learning outcomes. That's a key element focused on meter. And you can look at page four, I think it is, or, or so, on co at competency set number one. Meter, time, rhythm, uh, syncopations. Key signature is the second uh, 1.2 there. 1.3 addresses pitch, accuracy, intervals, arpeggios. 1.4, articulation, phrasing, 1.5, or 2.5, or 3.5, as we go through the series, uh, addresses tempo, and we introduce terms as a part of that. Uh, 1.6, introduces dynamic contrast, and in the second, third book, also interpretation. And then the 1.7 pulls, pulls each competency set together. So all of these elements are pulled together in an assessment exercise that, uh, that brings it all together and into focus. Now, each book, uh, once again, the focus is on having identified learning outcomes and it being accessible, having the assessment component. Those are very important. The book one that you have in your hand, the concept is that that book is to be introduced as, essentially as a classroom textbook or as an individual book that the students own themselves uh, in the second year of instruction. This is not a beginning band method. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, this is not for beginning band. This is after the student has completed a beginning, one of the standard beginning band methods. So let's say uh, the school starts in the sixth grade. This would be a seventh grade uh, classroom textbook, let's say. And uh, the second book, in a perfect world, the second book would be an eighth grade textbook. 
But in some situations, it might be a ninth grade textbook, depending on how much time uh, the, the director uh, has to actually spend in incorporating this into uh, the rehearsal. Essentially, uh, the concept is that if you can spend five minutes a day as a part of your warm-up process, going through these, uh, these competency sets, doing set one, and getting to the point where your kids have mastered set one before you go to set two, it might be two weeks. That's, a lot of this is reviewed uh, for the beginning band students. Uh, most of it, uh, it is, it's, well, all of these are within an octave, basically, uh, an octave of a second. But once a student has been through the complete beginning band method, they can deal with this first page pretty easily. So it might take two weeks. It might take you three weeks. If you're meeting once a, once a week with them, it's going to take you several months, maybe, or a couple or six weeks. It just depends on your situation, but the, the concept, make sure that you master concept one before you, uh, or competency set one before you go to competency set number two. Um, so 201 is introduced after completion of 101. 301 is introduced after completion of 201. So it might be a seventh grade, ninth grade, eleventh grade textbook that uh, builds upon each other. In the perfect world again, is seventh, eighth, and ninth, so that those kids, when they finish the ninth grade, they're actually musicians that can read. Wouldn't that be wonderful? How many are high school band readers? Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in your band could sight read? Does anybody have a, have a band that everybody in the band sight reads confidently? I never did. I never did. I mean, we all have first chair players and last chair players. I mean, that's that's a part of the. The, the nature of the beast, but uh, uh, most of us don't have the luxury of having well-prepared kids on that, those last chairs and those last chairs. Now, conducting a win ensemble at one of the largest schools in the state, maybe, but that's a rare, rare opportunity that uh, some are blessed with, very few. So, the concept is that it's a sequential program. One of the most unique elements is the, the assessment. Let me show you. This is what the assessment pack. There are three books, actually, 101, 201, 301. The assessment pack is kind of the, and honestly, this has drawn more attention.